time has come for Abraham to die. It happened some 3,500 years ago, give or take a couple hundred years. And his remains, the dirt that his body has turned to is still with us somewhere over there in the Middle East. But Abraham lives. I love what the Lord said when those people were, dying, were denying the resurrection. He said, don't you know that God said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Abraham lives. While well, I was thinking about this message, it was either the end of October or the 1st of November where uh, Doris Daniel died. And I thought, she lives much more than you and I live. The Lord said, when thou wilt enter into life, this is not life. The Lord had appointed this day for him. Verse 7 says, And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived. 175 years then Abraham gave up the ghost. The Lord had appointed this day for him to die, and our day is appointed. The day you and I are going to die has already been determined by God. Let me read Acts chapter 17, 26. He's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed. He determined your birth. He's already determined your death and the bounds of their habitation. He's determined where you'd live. He has determined everything. Isn't that wonderful? I love it being that way. And I don't want to know when I'm going to die. I don't want to know about it because I, I, I particularly don't want to know how I'm going to die because I would rather die in such a way that is pain-free and uh, I don't have to suffer. I would much prefer that. Um, but the day of my death and the day of your death has been appointed. You know, there's something about that that just makes you not worry, doesn't it? I mean, everything's in the Lord's hand. Other than the Lord himself, Abraham is the most significant man in the Scripture. He is the man God appeared to. And it appears that when the Lord appeared to him, we don't read of any other believers that were on the earth at this time. I don't understand this, but God did say, I called him alone. I called him alone. And at that time when God called him, he appears to be the only believer. And he was, as we've seen very clearly, a man just like me and you. He was a weak man. He was a sinful man. He was an unbelieving man. And the scripture gives us many examples of that in his life. I think of that time when he told Sarah to lie to Abimelech. He'd already done this years before with the Pharaoh. But this time he says, to Sarah, tell him, you're my sister. He'll kill me if you don't. And you remember what the Lord did. He appeared to Abimelech in that dream. And um, Abimelech afterwards said, why did you do this to me? He said, I thought. <laughs> There's a problem. I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this Place. That's Abraham. How wrong he was at that time. And God the Holy Spirit points out these 
flaws and inconsistencies and contradictions in Abraham's life. And it's a reminder to us why we are the way we are. We see Abraham. But Abraham was a very special man, like no other man. He is called the friend of God. The friend of God. He is called the father of the faithful. Believers are called children of Abraham. God said to Abraham, In thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And we're testimony of that right now as we sit here. God said, I called him. Alone, What a special man by grace. Abraham is a great type of Christ in many ways. He's the covenant head of a people. All believers are called his spiritual seed. The seed of Abraham. In thee. Shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, all of God's blessings in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I think one of my favorite illustrations in the Bible of salvation is in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9. I'd like to read it to you. You can turn there if you want. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9. The writer to the Hebrews says, And as I may so say, Levi, who also received tithes, paid tithes. In Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, Levi paid tithes when he wasn't born. He was the great-grandson of Abraham. Abraham never met him. But the scripture says, Levi paid tithes. It does not say that the tithe paying of Abraham to Melchizedek was imputed to Levi. It says Levi paid those tithes. Now, Whatever Christ did, I did. When he obeyed the law, I obeyed the law. What a glorious type of Christ he is. What Abraham did, Levi did. What Christ has done, every believer has done. The Lord himself called heaven Abraham's bosom. He is the great example of faith. Genesis 15, 6, first time we read of believing. Abraham believed God. Now, I love the way the Lord appeared to him and said, Abraham, Abraham didn't have any children. He didn't have any posterity. And I've often thought that Abraham's name means a father of multitudes. And he didn't have any children. And I imagine he probably felt kind of weird sometimes when people said, hey, Abraham, if he knew what his name meant, which I'm assuming he did, he thought, that sounds kind of hollow. Father of multitudes, father of nations, and yet God appears to him and says, if you can count the stars in the sky or the sand which is by the seashore innumerable, that's your seed. Abraham didn't have any evidence that this was so by looking at himself. All he had was God's word. Is that enough? It's everything. Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Now he's 175 years old and he's been walking with God for some hundred years. Longer than any of us have. I think it's interesting. I'm 63. Abraham wasn't called by God until he was 
either 70 or 75 years old. That is when God called him. And then he walked with God for 100 years. Um, first thing that is recorded that he did was build the altar and call on the Lord. He spent the rest of his life doing that. But then he goes down into Egypt, Genesis chapter 12, and that's where he told his first lie about his wife to get out of trouble. And through that event, he became filthy rich. <laughs> Pharaoh saw that this was a man God blessed. And all the wombs in Egypt were closed up because he was there. And so they gave him money. That, that's how Abraham got rich, going down into Egypt. And Pharaoh made him rich. The Lord brings good out of evil. What Pharaoh was doing, I mean, what Abraham was doing was bad. But look how it turned out. Isn't that, aren't you, aren't you thankful the Lord's that way? He brings good out of evil. And then we read of Abraham separating from Lot, giving Lot deference and letting him taking the well-watered plains. And then we read of Abraham's encounter with Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who I have no doubt is the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, blessed be Abraham of the most high and this is during this hundred years of walking with Christ. We read in Genesis chapter 15 of him believing God. And it being counted to him for righteousness. We're taught the gospel right there. And then at the latter part of that chapter, the Lord told him, your seed is going to go into Egypt in 400 years. They're going to be stuck and then I'm going to bring them out. He learned history before it took place. In his walk with God, there was the issue of Hagar, where he didn't believe God. Sarah didn't believe God. They thought they would help out. He went into Hagar. Ishmael came, who represents salvation by works, men doing their part. Then we have the covenant of circumcision. We have God appearing to him uh, to tell him about the destruction of Sodom. We have him going back and doing the same thing in chapter 20 he did in chapter 12 with Abimelech and telling him that Sarah was his sister to protect himself. This is during this long walk with the Lord. In chapter 21, when he's 100 years old, that's when we read of the birth of Isaac. And then in chapter 22, that glorious gospel message, take now your son, your only son. What an experience that was when he saw the gospel. That's what the Lord was talking about when he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day when he saw that substitute provided for his son. I love when he said, God shall provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. What a gospel message we're given there. Then we read of the death of his beloved wife when he came to mourn and weep. And then in chapter 24, we hear of him as an old man sending out Eleazar to look for a bride for Isaac. And he got one too. Now it's time for him to die. 35 years has passed between the death of Sarah and now he'd married a woman by the name of Keturah, had a bunch of children from her. And now the time has come to die. His last breath. Verse 8. Then Abraham gave up the ghost. Now this wasn't the way the Lord gave up the ghost. When the Lord gave up the ghost, he gave death permission to come and take him. Abraham didn't give death permission. <laughs> Me and you aren't going to give death permission. Death is going to take us when the Lord determines for it to be. But look what it said of him. Then did Abraham give up the ghost and died in a good old age. Now that can't be said of everybody. Old age can be a very 
difficult, wretched, painful time. And you may have a very difficult old age. As I said, I prefer not to have a difficult old age. I, I might die with racked with pain and going through it many years. I don't know. Or I might die just like that. I don't know. But not every old age could be called a good old age. But Abraham died in a good old age, an old man, and this speaks of him dying with dignity. Dignity. I'd like to die like that. You know, I want to die well, don't you? I want to, I want to glorify the Lord in my death. I want to, I want to die with dignity, with, with believing God, uh, with the peace of knowing that whatever God sends my way is best. I'd like to die with dignity. Abraham did. Now, I know that by his grace, I will. And without his grace, I won't. I, I know it is that simple. But I would like to die the way Abraham did as an old man um, and dying with dignity and respect. You know, people respected Abraham. He was a kind man. He was a humble man. Look at the way the children of Heth, so they bowed before him and said, Thou art a mighty prince before us. They, and he, he was just, Abraham was a fine man. Well loved, well respected. He had treated people in a way that they were sad to see him go. He died as an old man. But look at this scripture, and this is so important. He died an old man and full. Full. Satisfied. He died a satisfied man. Now, does that mean that Abraham looked upon his past life and said, I've got no regrets. Everything's been great. You know it doesn't mean that. I guarantee you, Abraham, how many things in your past do you regret horribly? I dare say a whole lot of things. This is not talking about Abraham looking out over his life and saying, I've got no regrets. I've done so well. I, I can just use one example. I know he regretted the way he did Sarah. I guarantee he did. And I admire Sarah the way she forgave him. I mean, here he did this to her, let her go into a harem twice, and she forgave him. I admire her. But I guarantee you he regrets what he did, and a thousand other regrets. Well, what is this thing of him dying satisfied, satiated, full, full, like you've had a good meal and you're satisfied, you're full. What is this thing of him dying full? Because this is the way I want to die. This is the way I want you to die. What is this thing of dying satisfied? Well, he hinted at this in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, God will provide himself a sacrifice. You satisfied with that? Are you satisfied with that? God provides the sacrifice. Nothing for you to provide. He does the providing. He provided for himself. There's nothing you could provide for him that he would accept. He provided himself as the sacrifice. Let me tell you what that means. It is finished. Are you satisfied with that? Of him are you in Christ Jesus. Somebody says, how are you getting Christ? God's got to put you there. Of him. Are you in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption? Are you satisfied with that? In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete. Absolutely lacking nothing in him. Are you 
satisfied with that? Are you looking for anything else? By one offering, he hath perfected. Listen to that. He hath perfected them that are sanctified. Are you satisfied with that? Now, this is Abraham's satisfaction. He was satisfied with God's salvation. Now, God is completely satisfied with what Christ did. Amen? Christ is completely satisfied with what he did. God the Holy Spirit is infinitely satisfied with what Christ did. That's what he teaches us. That's what the Spirit bears witness of. Every believer is completely satisfied with what Christ did. Are you? Are you? Now that's Abraham's satisfaction. He was satisfied. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, let me tell you, when you're satisfied with what Christ has done, you're not looking for anything else. If you're looking for something else, if you're thinking, I'm afraid I'm missing something, you're not being satisfied with Christ. You're being satisfied with Christ, like Abraham was, dying full, satisfied, when you look nowhere else. Now, these are Paul's words in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered. Poured out like a drink offering, I'm ready to die. I'm now ready to die. And the time of my departure is at hand. Don't you love the way the death of the believer is called a departure? It's a departure to an infinitely better place. The time of my departure is at hand. Now look what he says next. I have fought a good fight. Now somebody's thinking, I couldn't honestly say I fought a good fight. I can see all kinds of things that would keep me from being honestly able to say I fought a good fight. And Paul did. Uh, how is that? How could someone ever look at their life and say, I have fought a good fight? Well, here's how I did it. I've kept the faith. <laughs> That's the fight of the good fight. I have kept the faith. I've finished my course. I persevered looking to Christ only. Now, this is what he's talking about when he's talking about fighting this good fight. I've finished my course. I've continued in this. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that when God first saved me, and you know what? I've never left that. By the grace of God, this is all I have. God forbid that I should glory. And remember, this is Paul speaking. He said, I wouldn't glory in anything but the cross of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now, here's how I've fought a good fight. I've persevered in looking to Christ all the way to the end. Now, that's what perseverance is. Perseverance isn't remaining religious. Perseverance is continuing to look to Christ only. May God give me the grace to die just like that. That's why I'm ready to offer, be offered. Now look what he says next. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. You know, I've heard sermons before on believers in their crowns. You know, you've got the soul winner's crown, you've got the righteous living crown, you've got the, all the different crowns, I guess, they must have big heads up in heaven where they wear all those crowns, you know. But uh, 
That has nothing to do with what is being said. A crown of righteousness. That is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is the crown of righteousness. And look what it says. I love the way it says this. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. Now, I would think what an act of grace and mercy that is in the Lord that he would give such an unworthy one this righteous crown. And I agree. Wouldn't it be an act of grace for you to be given a perfect crown of righteousness? And there, there he is, absolutely righteous without sin. But I love it the way it says, the, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. You know what that means? That means when that publican went home after beating on his breast, crying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Christ said, I tell you, that man went down to his house justified. Not forgiven, though he was. Not shown mercy, though he was. But this man went down to his house having never sinned. That's what that means. He went down to his house justified. And when God, the righteous judge, gives me and every other believer this crown of righteousness, it's going to be because that's exactly what they deserve. That's how real justification is. Look what Paul says next. He says, not to me only. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Well, I'm one of them. I love his appearing as my surety before time began. I love his appearing before God's holy law when he kept it in my behalf during his days upon this earth. I love his appearing on the cross when he put away my sins. I love his appearing when he walked out of that tomb with the complete salvation and justification of his people. I love his appearing right now representing me as my intercessor so that all God sees is Christ and how I'm going to love his appearing when he returns. Are you one of those people? This crown of righteousness is not just for me, but it's for all of those who love his appearing. Abraham dies satisfied with Christ, not looking for anything else. You know, it'd be a horrible thing to be looking for something else, wouldn't it? Because you'd never find it. You'd never find it. There's got to be more. Well, you ain't getting it, whatever it is. The only way to die satisfied is looking to Christ alone. And really, that's the only thing faith really is. It looks to Christ alone. It doesn't look to Christ and. It looks to Christ alone. And that's what true perseverance is. Persevering and looking to Christ alone. And right now, I can say this with I hope I haven't fooled myself, but all I have is Christ right now. Right now. He's all I have. I got nothing else. I don't want anything else either. I'm satisfied to be saved by Christ alone. Now, that's what is meant by Abraham dying satisfied. Fool. I love the hymn we sing. Oh, that will be glory for me. Glory for me, glory for me. When by his grace I shall look on his face. That will be glory. Be glory for me. You see, the death of the believer is described in three ways in the scripture. Blessed. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. And the Lord told John, write it down. 
right. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Now their blessedness is being in the Lord. Oh, uh, you see, the only reason I would fear death is because of sin. That's the only reason I would fear death. But if the sin question has been answered, what do I have to fear? I have no sin. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. And then the death of the believer is called precious. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. Best day of your life will be the day of your death if you die in the Lord. Would you turn me with me for a moment to 1 John chapter 3? Verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. If you can look at God's law and see anything in yourself but sin, you have not seen the law. You don't even know what it is. You've got a very low fleshly view of the law. But if you've seen what the law is, you know sin is the transgression of the law. You know, anytime I even quote the Ten Commandments, every time I quote them, I think, broke that one, broke that one, breaking that one, breaking that one, constantly, nonstop. Sin is the transgression of the law. Verse 5, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Now, do you hear that? Why did he come? Why was he manifested? To take away our sins. And in him, is no sin. You know what that means? If you're in him, guess what? You have no sin. In him is no sin. Now, if you have no sin, there's no reason to fear death, is there? Verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, it's interesting. I've read so many different versions of this. Whoever abides in him doesn't practice sinning. Whoever said that did not get that from the Scripture because it doesn't say he doesn't practice sin. It says he doesn't sin, period. He sins not. Well, what's it mean to abide in him? It means the only place you want to be found is in him at all times, under all circumstance, circumstances. Let me be found in Christ so that all God sees is Christ. I want to stay right there, and I don't want to stick my finger outside of that place, abiding in him. Whoso abideth in him sinneth not. Now, let me tell you something. You know the reason I'm going to go into heaven? And it's scary saying this but it's because I, I, I've never sinned. That's what that says, isn't it? The reason I'll be in heaven is because I have never sinned. I sin not. I sin not. Now, when somebody says, well, that means we don't practice sin. You're lying. You've lost all credibility. Nobody believes you. You have no understanding of the scriptures and you have no understanding of God. When somebody says, well, I don't practice sin. You were practicing sin when you made that statement. I mean, they, yeah, that, 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 all is, that statement right there was enough to condemn you. You're lying when you say that. 
Um, that's not what the scripture teaches. The person that abides in Christ, we'll look in verse 9 of the same chapter. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now, there he's talking about the new nature. That's what does not commit sin. The new nature. It never sins. How can it? It's born of God. It's holy. Well, can that which God births commit sin? Absolutely not. But here it says, that, and that's talking about the new nature, and you've got an old nature that all it does is sin. You've got a new nature that never sins. But what verse 6 is talking about is abiding in Him, and that's what faith in Christ is. That means I'm going to go into heaven having never sinned. Now, somebody says, but you have sinned. He put it away. It's gone. It's not. And I, I, I'm amazed by this, but when God looks at me, I've said this in the last week, I can't remember which message, but when God looks at me in heaven, he's not going to be saying, I remember what you did. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I stand without guilt before God. Now that is the hope of justification. That's the hope of the gospel. And the reason Abraham could die with such hope is because he didn't sin. One other scripture, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now that's, that is an, an amazing concept. To stand before the thrice holy God in judgment with boldness? How in the world can you do that? Well, read the rest of the verse. Because as he is, so are we in this world right now, present tense. In this fallen world that we're living in right now. As he is, so are we. Now that's the only ground of boldness, isn't it? There is no other ground of boldness. Now for a believer, the character of death is different. It's called sleep. It's called sleep. Our friend Lazarus, Lazarus sleepeth. They that sleep in Jesus. The moment we die, we'll be with Christ. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Somebody says, well, how can you have a disembodied soul being with Christ? I don't know, but we do. I don't understand that. I know I won't be united in my body into the resurrection. Um, that's just what the Bible teaches. And somehow, the moment I die, I'm in the very presence of Christ. Today. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And when I'm united with my body in the resurrection, we'll all have glorified bodies. And what that means, I don't know that either. <laughs> but neither did John when he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when he said, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we will be like him. Now, do we understand that? Do we, can, can you even imagine what it would be like to be without sin? I can't even begin to fathom that. But that is the future of every believer. As for me, I'll behold thy face in righteousness. I'll be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. Now here's something that is amazing. I'll still be Todd, but you won't recognize me. But you'll know me. I'll still be Todd. You'll still be who you are, but it will be without sin. Now, when Abraham died, his faith was turned to sight. What he believed, he now saw. His hope was turned into experience. His love was turned into sinless love. 
when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart. Then, Lord, shall I fully know. Not till then, how much I owe. When I stand before thy throne, dressed in beauty, not my own. Isaac and Ishmael bury him in the cave by Sarah. I think this demonstrates what a, a great guy Abraham must have been because Ishmael participated in his burial even after the way Sarah treated him. And Sarah was hard on Ishmael, cast out the bondwoman and her son. But yet Ishmael wanted to participate in this burial. And I love to think of uh, the dirt that used to be Abraham still there. And it will soon be resurrected. And me and you too. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the hope you've given us in your son that when we die, that's when we will live. Lord, give us such confidence in thy son that we can look at death with joy, with anticipation. Lord, we don't, we can't say that we look forward to the pain that could be involved in our dying or the pain to others. Lord, we sorrow in death in that sense because we're flesh. But how we thank you for that time when we will be without sin, perfectly conformed to the image of your son. Bless us for his sake. We pray for your grace in the week ahead, the weeks ahead. Give us grace to, like Abraham, walk with you by faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.